Good morning, Mark. Hello. So what I'll do, I've been kind of saying to everyone as we've been going, when you're down to your last two minutes, I will switch my camera back on. When I switch my camera back on, that means it's time to start winding up. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Um, yep, we can, can see, you see my screen. screen? As well. Perfect. That's excellent. Just Where are you it. located, Mark? I am in the very north of Scotland. Ah, okay. So it's afternoon for you. Yeah, it's um, 4.30 in the afternoon. Ah, fantastic. So it's been it's been a long day. We're getting there. Yeah, I am in Portland, Oregon, so it's only 8.30 in the morning on a Saturday here. Oh, very early start then. <laughs> Yeah, we tried to line everyone so that we had sort of the Australian group starting with a kickoff, UK and Europe in the middle, and then US coming in towards the end. So everyone got their got their sessions. Ah, oh, that's fantastic. No, it's uh, very well planned here. So we'll just give everyone a couple more minutes. I'm going to enjoy this one because I am in the middle of doing one of these right now. Oh, yeah. Let's uh, look forward to, to some feedback. If you have some questions, uh, let me know. Cool. We have been doing this. Uh, I'll, I'll get to the intro, but there's a lot to consider. So I'm going to go into it. Good, good. I like that. And what's uh, what's your integration to? Um, we're using FNO. Ah, even better. So this is guided towards FNO. So we're going to explore a few things here. Awesome. Well, that's on the half hour. So I will just let you kick off and on you go. Awesome, everyone. Can you guys hear me OK? Everything perfect? All right. Well, thank you, guys. Thanks for having me here today. Uh, I'm in Portland, Oregon here, so it's a little bit early. I hope you guys don't mind a little bit of uh, a slow start here, but uh, super excited to be talking to you guys about uh, integrations, right? Let's talk about D365 field service and ERP. This is one of the things that we encounter a lot on the, the big projects, the, the big ERP, the big oil, for example, projects. There's usually an ERP behind the scenes when it comes to, to field service. Uh, during this session, uh, let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and kind of get started here. Uh, give you guys a little bit of an introduction, like who I am, what, a little bit of what I've done and, and what makes uh, me, giving me the right to kind of talk a little bit about um, integrations and field service. Also, we're going to shift it a little bit and talk about the good, the bad and the ugly in the future. Uh, given that this is a, a Saturday, wanted to, to bring a little bit of a spin. Uh, so we can have a little bit of fun as part of this this presentation. Also, guys, if you have any questions or anything that you you want to discuss here, uh, we'd love your feedback. We'd love to to kind of interact and also get into some of the low level details with regards to an integration with ERP. And lastly, we're going to go into the the future field service uh, field service FNO. Uh, or FN and supply chain integrations, right, or implementations. What are the things to look for? What should you be looking at? This is from an implementer to an implementer uh, sort of feedback and what we learned. So also look forward much uh, to having a little bit of fun here. So uh, my name is Lucas Diaz once again. So I've been doing this for a long time uh, now, about doing close to 15 years of uh, either ERP global delivery or uh, field service in one way or another. So I was uh, one of the guys long time ago that used to work with some of the field one guys in uh, helping and, and creating and also training on what is now uh, field service or uh, the, the new application. Uh, also, uh, the, some of the feedback that you guys are going to see comes from a variety of industries, uh, some of it in the medical devices, oil and gas, uh, some of the public sectors, uh, manufacturing, and also a little bit of flavor for human resources. You guys are going to see a little bit of that here. 
all of this really takes into it has to be taken into consideration when we're doing uh, an integration or a full global ERP field service implementation. All right, so let's switch it up a little bit. The good, the bad, or the ugly. Has anybody seen uh, this movie here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome, awesome. So we're going to have a little bit of fun here, guys, because this is really it. I, I feel every time that we do an implementation, it's like it's a wild, wild west, right? Some things are, are not necessarily baked. Some things need to be worked out. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's literally how we feel. But let's talk also not just the good, bad, and the ugly, but let's talk a little bit about the future and uh, what we think, what is going to happen, what, what we should be thinking about as architects here when we're designing this uh this integrations all right let's start with the good right so this is uh, usually the phase that we put in when we start looking at an integration uh from a field service perspective but yeah there's there's a couple of things that we got to consider right now so as part of the integration uh or, or fno or uh, supply chain there's an out-of-the-box integration that we normally use in order to send things back and forth, right? So some of those things are like warehouses, what uh, what warehouse and on-hand inventory is underneath a warehouse. So for example, if I have X amount of parts and um, I have a quantity of two on each and things like that. One of the things that to consider here is that this is basic inventory, right? So this is not necessarily serialized inventory or anything like that. So this is just basically a quantity and being able to, to basically keep on hand information. One thing to keep in mind is that when you have an integration with ERP, is that what becomes a system of record for the true on hand inventory. So when you post uh, a line or you post um, a, a work order, let's say in, in FNO um, on ERP, you may actually have double consumption of items, right? Of, of on hand inventory and also what becomes a, a true uh, the true inventory so for example if i've already used two parts but i haven't completed my work order i need to re deduct that uh, also in the erp to reflect what's my true inventory if you have a let's say a thousand techs and they all consume one part you're going to be pretty off with regards to inventory counts right so your cycle counts and things like that so one thing to really keep into um consideration when you're doing on-hand inventory from an erp perspective the next one, uh, it's being able to look at inventory adjustments and transfers. So a lot of the times when we have an ERP involved, we're dealing with more than just field service inventory, right? So a lot of adjustments are happening that are external to field service. So this integration here out of the box sometimes maybe needs to be either flipped or needs to be changed or needs to uh, adjust it for what we need to have because our system of truth or, or system of record, if you guys are going to hear me say a lot here, it may need to actually differ. But here in red, um, by the way, this is the, the project and inventory solution that you guys can download to create, uh, to have the integration with field service. I think you guys already are all familiar with that. But external projects and sales orders. So this is an area where we actually get into a, a lot of interesting discussions internally as to what's the best way to integrate it. So projects, uh, financial projects in, in, in FNO or ERP, right, allow us to kind of group a lot of uh, costs uh, associated with a work order per se. And, and one of the things is how do we reference the right project or the right agreement tied to the project within an ERP system. So this is an area, I think we're, we're I'm getting a little bit of my set ahead of myself here, but talking about how do we have the right project and the right agreement. And also when we're sending information back from a work order, where does it land? So currently right now it's a project journal or sales order, right? And in there, it goes directly into a sales order. So what if we want to also add a, more things to that work order line that it comes across, right? What if we want to have a different way of integrating? A, a lot of um, clients still use the service management module as a recipient, even though it's a, a I would say a defunct or, or kind of old uh, module and, and Microsoft may or may not uh, deprecated in the near future, but we need to have a repository in which somebody from finance can also take a look at the overall work order and things that came over. So products is one of the things that uh, comes over. This is great. I think we use it out of the box to be able to, to have published products, but this in itself also has some, some interesting things. We'll get into 
that as part of the the next chapter on our, on our movie here. Uh, P2C, another thing that we noticed is that in an in integration, uh, we have customers or accounts being created here uh, as part of the sale or the uh, field service, let's say, and then sometimes the accounts may actually not originate a, a, as part of CE. And so what we have to do is actually validate and going from ERP into field service. And that's one of the areas that, that presented us a little bit of trouble uh, with regards to the integration. So keep in mind, put your architect hat on and think about this a little bit as to what's gonna be my system of record. So one of the uh, areas here as well is that interestingly enough, we have the, the invoicing uh, happening in, uh, in ERP and that's one of the things that you got to also consider where are the invoices going to um, end up on. So is a technician going to be able to to have a, what we call an FSR field service report or an invoice and hand it over to a client or customer on site? Is that going to be produced? Is that going to be emailed or is that going to be kind of like a back office operation? So this is something that, that you guys got to uh, consider when we're going through the integrations. So this is part of the good because this is out of the box. This is something that we can use. And uh, there's a lot of work being done to kind of replicate this uh, on dual right, right? So uh, some of you guys might have heard that dual right will allow us to, to I think we're going to get into it in a little bit, but basically is the new technology that Microsoft is putting forward in order for us to have bi-directional integration between the two systems. So this is, is the old kind of proven old faithful per se with DI and getting data over and then uh, dual right is it's really up and coming. There's a little bit of tweaks that we need to do and a lot of growth that is going to happen, but it's getting much, much, much better to support our future implementations. Any questions, any thoughts here before we move on to the, the next part of our movie? Awesome. So let's go to the bad. Anybody got a question? Umar? Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, dual right, I didn't get your uh, point. So what you just explained is not in dual right. So how much is in dual right? Yes, we're going to get into that as part of the future uh, oh. here toward, towards the end. But one of the things is that this is that the out of the box DI data integrator solution or project. So if I go ahead, actually, I'm going to shift over here into my presentation. So to the um, my power platform. So in this case, I created a project and as part of uh, the templates that, that Microsoft provides per se, right? In this case, I'm doing the work order integration. So um, in here, it allows me to not only figure out what that any transformations that I need to do and also review the mapping or any um, kind of advanced query or any any changes or transformations that I need to do as part of the data coming over. So this is kind of on the DI side. Uh, dual right will also have uh, this functionality, but out of the box, basically you guys can see um, how the integration right could could be used immediately. But um, I'm gonna Umar, I'm gonna answer some of the dual right questions here shortly. All right, so from the good, let's go to the bad. So there's things that we also need to consider as part of this implementation, right? Especially with ERP. One of this is questions that you guys really got to ask yourself. So for example, workers. Workers, are all workers going to be users or are all workers going to be, um, are they going to be a mix of contractors? Are they all bookable resources? So meaning that um, if there's a company in ERP that has a thousand workers, a, in the system, are they all going to be bookable resources? Are all of those, are those workers going to be contractors? If so, do they need to be contacts or do they need to be users? So this is something that we got to consider from a licensing perspective, right? Making sure that we have um, not only the right counts, but when we're wiring up this integration, that they land in the right place as well. There's other things that we got to consider here from the HR side is um, there's uh, also skills and things like that. What skills are going to enable me? So Diane, uh, Diane was was showing about the the schedule board here a few minutes ago. Is being able to understand how we we map that from an HR perspective into field service because that really helps me to keep my my technicians happy and so on and be able to track their skills and the way that I uh, optimize the, the right person for the right job. The next thing is that agreements and agreement lines is in FNL. 
So I think we were talking about here earlier before you guys joined. In FNO, we have the concept of agreements. So agreements uh, obviously is, is almost identical with uh, regards to fields at a header level, what we have in, um, in field service, but we got concepts here of agreement lines. Basically that allows me to know kind of what object or customer asset is covered, but it, it doesn't cover some interesting scenarios. So for example, we have, um, I wanna cover all service equipment or all a different, um, let's say cameras or security systems or, or VCRs or whatever is on the site at a global level, right? What if I have 3000 of this? Am I gonna have 3000 lines for each or could I have one that makes it much easier for me to be able to track? So that's one area that it that really has a little bit of uh, kind of uh, thought that needs to be put in into this integration. The next one is how are we going to handle renewals? What about intervals? So for example, when I sell something, I know if you guys are um, maybe familiar with, uh, like if I buy something at Samsung, right? And I'm going to buy a giant uh, TV and then uh, are they going to come and service it? Is it going to have an agreement or renewal or a warranty per se? So that needs to be considered as part of the agreement set up within FNO. So if I, I was showing you guys earlier, being able to have those lines or agreement lines, is going to be really important in CE as I kind of look at this work order and understand what's covered or not. So another one is that service objects or EAM, enterprise asset management. So there's a lot of talk and there's a lot of progress here being done on the Microsoft side, but also what kind of assets am I really uh, looking at? What categories do I have and how that relates over to agreements? So a, for example, an object or service object or customer asset, it's also related to a type or a, a customer asset category. How am I going to group that? How does am I going to track specific characteristics for or, or details for that uh, service object, a, aka customer asset, when I bring it over into field service? So that's a, a very important consideration because we got things like serial numbers. If I jump over here, um, in the service objects in finance and operations, yeah, we got like the serial number, but these are all tax fields. So remember my my discussion about serialization earlier is that this is just serial number or details that we need to bring over in order for the tech to be able to either enable scanning and uh, through their field service mobile device or be able to see the most pertinent information on this service object. Also, there's the EAM part of it, right? So being able to, some customers may actually have the, um, in the different, actually, let's go into it. So may actually have details that they want to capture, for example, for internal assets. What if there's an internal PM that we need to, to schedule? So interestingly enough, uh, in FNO or FNS, uh, there's also the ability to try kind of work orders associated internally. But what about, how does this play with field service, right? So this is something that we must also think about when it comes to the integration uh, between um, the two systems. So also parts request. So this is an interesting one and it has, I am sure, uh, you guys have seen this in the field before. What about a parts request? How do I know my parts request is not only being fulfilled? What if it's in back order? What if it's uh, it's now in my inventory, right? What if I have 2000 parts and I need this specific one? How do I know that uh, I am going to be able to consume it now on the front end on the field server side, right? So also, what about R uh, RMAs and RTVs? Uh, so RMAs is returning something that I didn't use, something that is out in the field. So if I'm going to take a big piece of equipment out of the field uh, or a customer site, how does the RMA integrate over into the system? How do we track it and put it into quarantine? How does this work into the, the warehousing or the, the cycle counts and things like that? Does this go back into inventory, quarantine? How, uh, what about RTV or return to vendor? So something that needs a, an advanced replacement and those kind of scenarios, we got to think about that uh, when it comes to the, the implementation. So this is the bad. So kind of understanding what we need to do here or custom stuff that we needed to create. Now, the ugly. So 
when you integrate with an ERP, there's some very, very, very important things that you got to consider. So, for example, the legal entities. So, in um, I'm going to just keep saying FNO since this is so familiar. But in ERP, in FNO, we have the concepts of legal entities. So, um, this is something that is, is kind of loosely coupled within, um, within CE. So, if I have, for example, a U.S. company, U.S., U.K., um, India or so uh, or so forth. How does this land into CE or into field service? And also, where remember earlier I was talking about being having a system of record and being able to send back some data. For example, customer assets. What if I'm installing something on the field uh, as part of my mobile device and that needs to go into EAM or uh, a service object with an FNO? What company does it go to? How do I make sure that I need um, a that it lands in the proper entity. So we have an interesting part here in that each one of the, um, the entities, right, through CDS, uh, now we have the ownership. So we got to be really, really careful because some entities may have different ownership uh, of the records that get created for this entity. So we got to make sure that it, if it's not a, a user or team or if it's org, uh, as part of the ownership. So you got to make sure that you have a, a, a company ID or legal entity field to delineate where it lands or when it gets created. Uh, the other thing that we got to think about the ugly is that integration, uh, integrator schedule and error handling. So literally the data integrator <laughs> error messages and sorry, Microsoft, Ben, I don't know if you're listening, but cover your ears. But uh, the error management in here is sometimes it has a lot of room for improvement. I know that it's getting better with with dual, right? But sometimes I know you guys have seen just some errors that that just give you an object reference and that's it. Uh, and also there's a very important thing that you guys must consider asynchronous versus synchronous where you're pulling or pushing data has different limitations. So, for example, if you're doing a poll, uh, let's say that I want to bring in from an ERP um, let's say all agreements, right, uh, that are that are in the system. So remember that this is currently, there's a bug within the integration or data integrator that it times out at 300 seconds. So if you have a large data set, let's say you bring in a couple hundred thousand records, it may time out on you. So just keep that in mind as you're doing that, that uh, the synchronization and try to reduce the data sets and also the number of fields that you're bringing over as part of the data integrator mapping make sure that you have that as, as fine-tuned as possible. The great thing is that on the opposite way, so pushing data into it, uh, it's an asynchronous uh, call. So we can actually, um, we haven't seen it time out, but just be very, very mindful of the schedule on and, and handling, uh, error handling as well. And also uh, going into data management in FNO, being able to see what packages get created when the data is coming across, that's your friend. So guys, I know we talk a lot of field service and CE and all that stuff, but get really familiar with data management in FNO if you're going to do an integration. Okay. The next thing that you got to also keep in mind when we're doing this is the data integrator uh, project migration. So how do, if I set up a, when you're dealing with a, with a big ERP project, you may have up to four environments, dev, um, uh, Business, um, business analyst testing or BAT, you may have UT, INT, production, staging, and so on and so forth. So the project export and project migration using DI uh, has some grounds for improvement, right? And being able to, to not only create templates and things like that, which takes us part of the way, but we got to make sure that we you, you validate on each one of those environments and set up the, the data integrator project as part of your integration. Also, uh, advanced query. So interestingly enough, uh, with advanced query, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but in here, I am able to being able to use advanced query and be able to do special mappings, right, or do uh, specific transformations and be able to also do filtering on the, the source or destination in order for me to have a really solid um, integration. Some fields, uh, for example, a work order a, or, or a, a, a customer asset type or, or customer asset category needs to be transformed into, uh, 
a service object group within FNL. So sometimes you may need to add a, a letter, a number, or something like this, or shorten the fields, or also set a default flag when uh, things come across. So literally, uh, advanced query is your friend. Uh, it's a little bit complex, but make sure that you actually uh, become familiar with it. And you also need to be very detailed oriented because it is not very apparent when you make a change in advanced querying one environment or one project, making sure that it's also on all the different projects. So there's um, lots of detail oriented uh, folks need to be involved with that. Questions so far, guys? Just doing a quick time check. We got seven minutes. All right, so the future. So when you're going into a field service implementation, um, just remember that DI, Data Integrator, and Dual Write may not play, not play nicely. I know that there's some work being done there, and Ben, uh, you may have the very latest there, but being able to have uh, Dual Write uh, to play nicely. So Dual Write is, is the very latest um, kind of technology or, or, or uh, solution here that we're going to implement uh, as part of integrations in the future. Uh, another thing that we got to do is make sure that you identify the system of record for main entities. What system owns which entity? Why do I say that? Because if you're going to create uh, customer assets in field service and you're going to create customer assets in an FNO, you may have a conflict there or also you don't know, um, you, you got to make sure that it's uh, for, for performance perspective that it comes over from one system to another so that it works well. Uh, and also this will drive the direction of your project on the DI side and also will keep you a little bit sane uh, when you have things kind of flowing usually one way meaningly or, or meaningfully. Uh, we talked a little bit about that, getting familiar with the data management module and understanding uh, dependencies. So when you're getting into the entities in FNO, just making sure, for example, a customer asset or service object needs to have a group or a customer asset category. So just understanding the dependencies or where that's going to be created. And like we talked about earlier, is that uh, you got to make sure that it's you're, you're taking into consideration what other areas, uh, for example, agreements, if you're going to put a service object uh, in an agreement in FNO, you got to make sure that all the data dependencies are, are considered. Okay, so also we talked a little bit about having detail oriented uh, folks dealing with uh, data integrator and also advanced query. But one of the things is that establish DevOps communications for all integration changes. So making sure that when you make a change in dev to the integration that it gets propagated all the way through all the environments and also create all the designs. So normally when we, uh, before we even touch a single inch of uh, or, or um, a page of integration or we set up CDS, we really just go to the drawing board and understand why each entity needs to communicate with uh, the corresponding one in the ERP system. And the last one is make sure you test, test, test and make sure that you um, all the data is coming across and you're not getting any errors in the DI. Okay, more details here. So I think we're going to share this um, this presentation with everyone, but make sure you get familiar with dual write, the overview and the integration and also the, the company concept. So dual write, they're making a lot of progress with having this legal entity uh, match up as well here. And from an implementer perspective of architect, I can honestly say that you know, as we are progressing here in the next month or two, few months, that that really, if you're starting an implementation, consider potentially having dual right uh, as your integration uh, mechanism here between um, CE field service and ERP. And lastly, guys, uh, if you haven't, uh, go watch the good, bad, and the ugly. It, it really, it's it's kind of, it, it has a lot of correlation for me as when we start an integration with ERP here uh, for all the field service projects. So I'm going to open it up. We got four minutes here for questions. I know I threw a lot of information at you guys, uh, but uh, any questions? This is Umar again. Uh, so uh, legal entities, you mentioned about it and mapping to maybe or consider uh, ownership. So what exactly is the out of the box? Is there any solution there or are, are you saying that we need to create a solution for this if more than one legal entities are involved? Yeah, so there's a different, there's a couple of different ways that we can do it, right? So when we're set, uh, setting the integration project, it actually tells you what org is going to go into. And also when you create records in an entity, it has an ownership. It could be either at the org level 
or the the user level like I was talking about here. So you have to make sure that you take all of this into consideration. So start uh, depending on the, um, the entity that you're integrating with, the ownership may be different. So for example, for accounts, it's a uh, ownership of uh, user or team, but for some is org. And so when you're sending, you really don't know when you're sending data into CE, you don't know what legal entity is in. Uh, so you have to be very careful. I hope that answered your question in some way. I'm not sure if uh, account ownership is org level. It's just uh, use. It's always user level, right? It's out of the box. Uh, uh, so okay, let me put a question differently. If there are two uh, legal entities, uh, and for in account integration, uh, what will happen? Uh, do we need to consider a cons custom field for legal entity or? Uh, or or what so it's funny enough we we did this uh, as we we started using the business unit right so because business unit in ce oh, you have yeah. a structure but yes. a, the business unit may not play nice you gotta make sure that it's consistent throughout all your entities and that it's also uh pretty structured because you may also have business units that are non-integrated as well so you just gotta so let's say I have a U.S. as a business unit, but underneath it, I have each state in the U.S. as a subunit, right, or of a child business unit, and those do not need to be integrated. So just keep that in mind. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? This is Pierre. I was going to say on multi-company um, stuff like that, it certainly is not um that big of a deal it's just literally to put a binary like or a pick list on the account or even the work orders um to just say this is this belongs to this um, business unit the integration engine can then pick that up and shun it to the appropriate you know transaction so so it, it's it can be very simple or systematic like you're saying like business units or or um but <clears throat> from the field service standpoint, you know, it's uh, it is a complexity that we have, but most ERP systems business unit are kind of multi legal entities really is inconsequential, even to often the users. It has more to do with those business um, legal rules and much less to do with the customer service or fulfillment of the processes. So so totally. sometimes it's the binary switch or some sort of UI experience that either automatically defaults or but basically just puts a field then on the you know xml record yeah totally so interestingly pierre so talking about this i know we're a little bit over our time we had a situation in which really the work the agreement or the site right is what drove my legal entity per se and the work orders that were created associated with was the driver to funnel it all the way through into FNO. So sometimes you you may have no business unit at the work order level, but on the site, or you may have it at the agreement. It really depends on how you're wiring your integration. But uh, yes, a, a flag, a, a way to, to kind of link it through to make sure that it lands properly in FNO, it, it's a must. So you got to think about it as part of creating the integration. The other one you can use is dual right will install companies as entities and customer engagement as well. You can kind of use a mix of the companies. If the companies are direct to a legal entity in FNSCM, it can also sometimes work that way with a security role in a business unit in CE. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And so as part of dual right, we, we were in a precarious situation in which we started uh, one of our biggest implementations pre dual right maturity. Right, so we had to kind of wire some things out. We couldn't necessarily stop this train and say, okay, let's go ahead and do dual, right? We were already moving in that in the, the DI direction, but going forward, absolutely, Marcus is right. Being able to use that concept, that, that company concept, and also augmenting the, the integration to add additional entities like agreements uh, or agreement lines, right? So customer assets and, and growing that as well. It, it's going to be pivotal here. For a successful implementation. With that said, I'm a minute over or two <laughs> minutes over. Thank you. Really appreciate it. No problem. Thank you very much. So we have Raj next.